Numismatics can pop up anywhere, and in this episode of the Coin Week podcast, we take a very unexpected turn and discuss one of several embedded symbolic themes of filmmaker Stanley Kubrick's classic horror film, The Shining. The film, The Shining, is based on Stephen King's horror novel of the same name, but has a number of unique storytelling elements of its own. The horror novel is famously disapproved of Kubrick's treatment, but that hasn't stopped the film from becoming a landmark in its own right. In this podcast, I interview Rob Ager, a popular YouTuber and film analyst, whose channel, Collative Learning, breaks down the film to a granular level. Just the kind of YouTube wormhole you late-night insomniacs might be looking for after you've put away your last bottle of jewel luster and air-dried your last batch of silver coins. Rob produced a series of videos about The Shining and Kubrick's gold standard symbolism, and we wanted to talk to him about it. Get ready to get creeped out next on the Coin Week Podcast. But before we get into that, don't let something truly horrifying happen to your rare coin investments. Protect yourself by asking your dealer or auction house to offer you coins that take advantage of PCGS's patented new NFC anti-counterfeiting protection. This state-of-the-art peace of mind giver will open the door to a new way to access the latest information about your coins and to ensure that your coin is genuine and the holder that it's in is a genuine PCGS product. Visit www.pcgs.com to learn more. Well, hi, Rob. Thanks for joining me on the Coin Week podcast. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invite. Much appreciated. Well, you probably never expected to be interviewed on a numismatic podcast, but one of the things that I find when I look around the world is that money is everywhere and symbolism and references. And what we actually define as money gets talked about quite a bit in unexpected places. And so... When I was traversing the wormhole that is YouTube, I stumbled upon a few videos that you produced where you talk about the gold standard and how it was referenced purposefully by filmmaker Stanley Kubrick in the 1980 horror movie, The Shining. So I wanted to talk to you about that because I think it's a fascinating topic and I wanted to know what you could tell us about the connections between the gold standard, that history, and the film. Did Kubrick actually mean to say something important? about the topic? I would, I would say I'm 95 to 98% convinced that uh, Kubrick intentionally put that into the film, yeah. So, describe what you think in the film refers to the gold standard, and how did you come to that conclusion? Okay, well, um, the first thing was that, um, I, I, mean, I think probably I should just mention for your listeners why I even bothered looking in The Shining in the first place or anything. Um, I mean, I was um, making short films, I was writing and directing and editing, and I was just trying to improve my own uh, filmmaking skills. I had no idea at that point that there were any filmmakers out there who had deliberately encoded uh, hidden things in their movies. Um, I knew that Hitchcock used, um, uh, you know, Freudian psychology in his movies, so I was interested in that. And so I was studying The Shining because it was one of my favorite movies, and I was just interested in how to sort of learn as a filmmaker from The Shining. So I was studying it shot by shot, studying the details uh, of the sets, the costumes, everything. And I started to notice all of these fascinating details that implied that there was a hell of a lot more going on in the movie uh, than the basic supernatural plot. And uh, I mean, initially the first thing that I came across, which lots of other people have come across as well and is quite widely discussed, is the the issue of uh, native genocide, uh, the uh, you know the American Indians, um, uh, that that's a theme in the movie, which is now very, it's quite a well known theme. Uh, so I won't go into detail about it, but that was the first thing I, I, I sort of figured out. And among the other things I started to notice was this uh, emphasis on gold, uh, particularly the gold room sets in the movie uh, the huge gold room set is an amazing set it's one of the best movie sets I've ever seen it's really enigmatic so I was interested in that um, at the same time I was reading Stanley Kubrick biographies 
particularly the ones by John Baxter and Vincent Labruto. And the John Baxter biography, on I think it was around about page 159 and 160, uh, described Kubrick's absolute fascination with gold uh, when he was uh, producing The Shining. And um, it mentions in the book that Kubrick invested heavily in gold, and he had a lot of his wealth uh, stored as gold in Switzerland. And there were other things in there, such as I think Brian Aldous was working on the script for what became the movie AI. And he describes that Kubrick would just pop his head in the room now and then and say, oh, gold has gone down 2% or 2 points or whatever. Buy gold. You know, he was always advising them to buy gold. Uh, so that was another thing. And I think the co-writer on The Shining, uh, I've forgotten her name offhand, but she mentions, uh, she's quoted in the uh, the Baxter book, as saying that Kubrick was always advocating gold, a big believer in it. Um, So there was all that kind of stuff going on. And at the same time, I was learning a few bits on the side about uh, the gold standard. Uh, I was reading a little bit about monetary history, and I'm I'm no expert at all, but I started to tally this stuff up with what was in the, um, The Shining film. You talk about gold and Kubrick's fascination with it. There's actually a really strong connection between the Native American genocide and gold in America. Because the Indian Removal Act, which was enacted by Andrew Jackson, removed the Cherokee Indians off of their land in the Carolinas and northern Georgia. This happened because gold was discovered on these lands, and as a response, the United States Mint created two branchments, one in Dahlonega, Georgia, and the other in Charlotte, North Carolina, to process that gold. There was also the Great Sioux War of 1876, Custer's Last Stand is probably the most famous battle from that war, and that was precipitated by the discovery of gold in the Black Hills. And of course, the most famous gold discovery of all was in California, and yet again that involved the removal and displacement of native tribes. So, there's quite a connection between mineral extraction in America and how it affected the indigenous peoples. Wow. That, I mean, that, that is a, a whole connection between the two that I have no awareness of at all. <laughs> Thanks for that. So tell me about what you do see in the film. Okay, so there's, you know, the details uh, that I mentioned, um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about it with the Gold Room set, was that uh, the... The the walls in the gold room, uh, they're made up of very tiny gold tiles, so it looks like stacks of gold bricks. And um, I had a a conversation with a lady called Joan Honor Smith, and she was an airbrush artist. And her job on The Shining was that she superimposed the photo of Jack Nicholson into the old 1921 photo that we see at the end of the movie. And when I spoke to her, she, I had a phone conversation with her. She's, you know, she's over 80 now and she, she lives down south. And, um, but she still had a fairly good memory of uh, the, the movie. And she was telling me that she, when she went to visit uh, Stanley on set to discuss the, these photos, uh, he allowed her to just wander around the sets and just explore everything that was being filmed. And she told me something pretty amazing about the Gold Room set. She said that it was initially the Silver Room and it was all silver tiles, and that you know this crew members spent ages individually gluing these silver tiles onto the walls to create the whole set. And then Kubrick came in and looked at it and said, "Yeah, yeah, that's very, very good. That's good. Uh, now, can you redo it in gold?" <laughs> I, I just thought that was so funny. And she said that the the, uh, the crew members were were just infuriated, but they had to do it. But again, you know, that ties in with the silver and gold in the Constitution as being the the only legal forms of tender. Uh, So that was a big one. But the one that really solidified for me and confirmed to me that the the theme was pretty much almost certainly intended was uh, I went to the Stanley Kubrick archives in London and I was looking at various uh, items there. And one of them was uh, a prop called Jack's Scrapbook which we do see in the film uh, in one scene, and this is when Jack Nicholson is arguing with his wife at his typewriter, saying that he wants to write without being interrupted. 
and you, you get a couple of shots where this huge scrapbook is on the desk next to the typewriter, and it's obviously research materials for Jack's book. Now, in the novel of The Shining, that uh, Jack's scrapbook, it's, it's in um, the novel version, but in the novel it just contains a history of the Overlook Hotel itself. And from that, uh, the, the main character is writing his book. But um, in the movie version, the Jack scrapbook prop, which is available to look at in the Kubrick archives, is full of old newspaper clippings from the 1920s and 30s regarding World War One and Two. But, but very particularly, there's a lot of stuff in there about the gold standard, uh, the Federal Reserve Act, how it was how it was passed. A lot of stuff about Woodrow Wilson and his relationship with uh, the banks and uh, the gold standard. There was tons of that stuff in this book. And I thought, well, that's got nothing to do whatsoever with um, the source novel. And, you know, for, for Kubrick to actually arrange to have all of these newspapers gathered from back then, I don't even know where he got them, and to go through and cut out all of these specific articles related to these uh, themes of the gold standard and the banks um, and there's a lot of stuff in there about Nazis transferring gold around to Switzerland and stuff like that I thought my god uh, well, what more confirmation do you need other than Kubrick himself coming in and saying yeah I did that If that book was some kind of subliminal contextual prop what do you think the point was that Kubrick was trying to make with this infusion of gold symbolism well, I can only speculate on that, really. But you know, looking at his filmography, you know, Doctor Strange Love, right through to Eyes Wide Shut, it's pretty clear that Kubrick was very anti-establishment. Uh, he didn't trust people in power. Um, his wife, Christian, there was a Guardian interview, interview she gave a few years back, where she said that Stanley always told everybody stay away from people in power. It's dangerous, and you know, he was clearly very distrusting of uh, people in a lot of power. So, on that basis, I think he, he, he was making a critique regarding um, the monetary system in America and the gold standard. And I, basically, I think he basically encoded it into the movie. Nobody was going to figure it out from the, those shots of the, the scrapbook, but you can figure it out if you go to the archives and look at it there. One of the things I think about when I think about the film is the Overlook Hotel itself. Taking it out of the horror context, it seems like the kind of place, especially the Gold Room, that would have been geared towards the swells, the country's elites, its wealthiest people. Jack and his family were not the target demographic, so to speak. A working class family like Jack's would probably never be guests at the Overlook Hotel. The halls may be empty of the living while they're there, except for the ghosts of the past. With the exception of the ghosts of the daughters of the prior caretaker, the ghosts in the Overlook Hotel are affluent ghosts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, one of the, the most fascinating things for me, and uh, I think I included this in one of the videos I did online about it, is um, the, the black and white photos uh, that are in the sets of the Overlook in the film. And, you know, the only one that we really get a proper good look at is the one with Jack in it, with a, a big crowd around him. And uh, that was another thing I found in the archives, which you know, pretty much blew my mind and changed my perception of the film, was um, the various black and white photos that we see in the sets in the movie, they um, are in the archives. And I had a, a look at a box full of them. And they were all pictures of uh, bankers, movie stars, politicians, uh, most of them ranging between Woodrow Wilson's uh, administration and going right through to Kennedy's administration. Um, and some of those photos, are, I sort of reckon, I remembered you could, from the movie, uh, but you couldn't see them very well in the movie, but now that I was able to see them better in the archives, it was like, oh yeah, that's this person, that's that person. Uh, Betty Davis is visible in the movie uh, in a photo that's just upper right of the photo of Jack at the end. And in the lower left is uh, James Mason and his wife uh, in a fairly close-up shot, quite recognizable. Um, and James Mason is looking up towards the photo of Jack Nicholson. 
Um, so yeah, seeing all of these uh, photos in the archives, and there was a lot of photos of Woodrow Wilson as well. And for, again, that just made me realize, yeah, the ghosts and the overlook, it, it's all related to uh, the gold standard and the bankers going way back to, you know, the photo is listed as 1921. And if I remember correctly, most of Woodrow Wilson's um, administration, I think they left office in 1921. Um, I'd have to double check that. I think that's the case. But I started to recognize some of the figures around Jack Nicholson in the, the photo looking very, very much like uh, the, the people from the, the, the Wilson administration. Uh, some of them are absolutely bang on. Some of them are more open to interpretation. But uh, Benjamin Strong Jr., the first governor of the Federal Reserve, uh, he is uh, a couple of faces up and left of Jack in the photo. Um, Wilson's wife is directly right of um, Jack Nicholson. She's got her hand on his shoulder, I think. Um, I think her name was Margaret Woodrow Wilson. Uh, yes, it, it looks an absolute dead ringer for it. But the problem with that interpretation of the photo is that, you know, facial recognition systems, uh, you know, we would need something like that to absolutely confirm that these are the people in the photos. But even the, the facial recognition systems we got now, they require really good lighting, um, high resolution photos in order to recognize somebody. And when you've got people um, photographed at different ages, the recognition becomes extremely difficult then. So, you know, the photos thing is a little bit more open to interpretation as to who is around Jack. But definitely the stuff that I saw in the archives uh, was bankers and politicians at the time. And they were good quality photos. Yeah. So in the American psyche, FDR's recall of gold coinage, essentially Americans getting off the gold standard, uh, which, mind you, didn't officially happen until the Nixon administration. But from FDR to that point, Americans couldn't privately own gold bullion. And I think that's something that still bubbles up in America and, and provides a lot of economic anxiety. A lot of people in America are against the idea of fiat money, which is solely based on the trust of the government and would like to see a return of some kind of gold standard. A lot of people also stack gold and silver as a hedge against what they see as the potential for the collapse of the financial system. Is there a similar sentiment in Britain? Yeah, I, I, I think there is, but not among the general population. I mean, most people know very little about this stuff. Uh, I'm no expert myself, but I know far more than the average person in the street. Um, I have met uh, people over the years here who I've discussed gold with who've turned out to be, oh, yeah, I, I buy a bit of gold now and then. You know, they buy um, gold jewelry and keep hold of it because of its worth, or they might even buy coins. Um, I even had a, a, a friend who died and donated to me uh, a, a gold coin, <laughs> which was pretty cool. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's well, w it's funny that you mentioned that America coming off the gold standard and was it, you said the 1970s, was it 1973? Yeah. Well, essentially the government was paying its foreign debts in gold and it had fixed the price of gold. And then during the Nixon administration, they stopped making foreign payments in gold. That's essentially getting off of the gold standard. Though the government had stopped making gold coins in 1933 and recalled the coins that were outstanding from circulation, many did get expatriated to other uh, countries. Uh, but the coins that remained in the country were brought in to the government, and uh, with the exception of coins that coin collectors were allowed to keep. The Treasury Secretary at the time was a famous coin collector. But if you were a bank or an institution that was storing the gold coins as bullion, you were required by an executive order and then subsequent laws to return them. When the government received the coins, they melted them down, they made ingots, and they stored those ingots at Fort Knox, which was constructed for that purpose. Uh, and uh, those gold vaults are still there. Well, there is a sort of a superstitious belief that all the gold is gone. Uh, but it's still there. I've talked to several mint directors who, as part of their responsibilities, audited the facility. Treasury secretaries routinely visit there. Most recently and most famously was Steve Mnuchin, who visited there during the uh, solar eclipse a few years ago. Uh, so as a numismatist, I have, I have no reason to believe that it's not there. Uh, the, the, the big sort of issue I had on it was... Um 
I don't know if this is still true now, but when I was researching into this years ago, there was a lot of reports saying that the, the gold hadn't been properly audited since, I don't know, the 1960s or something, and that there was one or two um, public audits that were done, but they were only partial audits. Well, the vaults have seals, uh, tamper evidence seals, uh, so you don't literally have to open every vault, take every ingot out, and measure every ingot. Uh, if the seals had been disturbed, it would have been quite obvious. Uh, of course, there's a chain of custody of who's allowed in. Uh, but yeah, there was a public audit in the 1970s, uh, famously so. Major figures of the numismatic industry were there. Uh, so yeah, I have no doubt that it's there. And, and uh, people listening to this podcast will probably think I'm full of it, but yeah, I'm sorry, I really don't. It's interesting to hear you say that because um, I uh, thought that a lot of people would have the, the other point of view, but, you know, I'm, I'm open to both opinions. Well, that's an interesting insight into The Shining. Of course, uh, that was the film that scared the hell out of me when I saw it in first grade. Uh, that elevator scene will uh, never leave me. And I don't even think that elevator scene was in the book, as I understand it. I, I haven't read the book. No, it wasn't, but there is, um, somebody emailed me or, or messaged on one of my videos, I think it was an email, um, saying that they'd found something in the, the novel related to the elevator, and I went and checked the novel, and it is there, I'd, I'd missed it previously myself. Um, there's a moment where Jack Nicholson, uh, sorry, not Jack Nicholson, Jack Torrance in the novel, um, he... At one point, I can't remember why, but he becomes scared of an elevator that he sees. And he says that the elevator looked too much like a gaping mouth. And it's the, the, the chapter ends with that line. Um, it's too much by half. That, that was the final line, I think it was. And um, I read that and I was like, wow, because in, in the movie, uh, the elevator does look like a big gaping mouth with those two dials that look like big screaming eyes and... The elevator is intercut with Danny's face when he's screaming, like it's a big mouth. Um, so I thought that was a, an interesting relationship. Maybe Kubrick had spotted that in the, the novel and said, I can do something with that visually. Uh, but also, when I was looking in the Kubrick archives at the alternative poster designs uh, for The Shining, the, the various sketches that were done, which are fascinating, one of the things that popped up time and time again was that there were images of the hotel with doorways and windows as eyes and skulls, like, like there were um, faces that were subliminally embedded into the, the, the doors and windows, both internally and externally of the hotel. And there's nothing obvious like that in the movie. Um, but when you have that in mind and you go through the movie, you start to notice there are certain points where there are doorways with twin um, windows that look like eyes over us, you know, as part of a skull. I was like, I wonder if he did that on purpose. <laughs> well, it's surprising to me how Stephen King, the author, could be so cold on the film. I find that Kubrick's interpretation of the material is sort of an elevation of the idea. And Stephen King, I think, wanted it to hew much more closely to his original concept, especially regarding the character motivations. But when I saw his TV film of The Shining, which came out in the 90s, and the subsequent movie Dr. Sleep, I find that none of those come anywhere close to conveying the sheer amount of horror uh, that the original Shining film does. The TV one was, um, you know, no disrespect to the people who made it, but it's nowhere near as good as the, the Kubrick one. Um, I think it even ends with the hotel exploding, which is just so cliched, you know. Well, Rob, thanks for taking the time and calling us from across the Atlantic and sharing your insights into The Shining and sort of demonstrating to coin collectors that issues relating to money and coins can appear in the most unexpected places. Yeah, they certainly can. Life's fascinating, isn't it? Thanks very much for inviting me on, Charles. Much appreciated. Great. And uh, good continued luck with your YouTube channel and your videos. I enjoy watching them. Where can our listeners uh, go to learn more about you and your videos, not to mention your two-part video series about Kubrick and the gold standard? Uh, if you just go on YouTube and search for uh, Kubrick's gold story, you'll find my uh, detailed video on the shining and the gold standard. Uh, or you can go to my website, which is collativelearning.com, C-O-L-L-A-T-I-V-E. I definitely recommend everybody do that. 
especially watch the interpretive video about the Gold Room. Very interesting stuff. All right, then. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Okay. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Remember, you can download every episode of the Coin Week podcast for free on the iTunes Store. Stream it online on our YouTube channel or on CoinWeek.com. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting.